Hi, this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer of Community Culture Showcase, and welcome to our show today. So I'm very happy to have a very um, uh, interesting guest today because uh, I've always been interested and I used to like to go to the many museums that are in the area, and this one was kind of new to me, but it represents a very important uh, segment of our community. And I have with me Lorenz Spears, who is the executive director of the Narragansett Indian Museum, which is actually located in Rhode Island. And I had her to come here and talk to us about this museum, because I know many of you who are familiar with our community know about the Pequot Museum, but this is actually uh, a different, uh, represents a different tribe with, I guess, very different traditions. And um, it was a great opportunity. So I met Lauren at a, um, actually at a different meeting, and I saw her make a presentation, and I said, wow, what a great guest. So with that in mind, please, I welcome you and tell us a bit about yourself because you have a very you. interesting background, which is representative of a whole segment of our population, which we really probably just know from TV in a very wrong way. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the Narragansetts and actually about this wonderful little museum that you have. I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Askawi Kwasin, and that's hello in Narragansett. And I am Narragansett, Niantic, and um, I'm the executive director of Tomquag Museum. I come from a long family of Narragansett family members, obviously. And um, my grandparents were Eleanor and Ferris Dove, or are Eleanor and Ferris Dove. My grandmother is still living. She's 96 right now, who owned and operated the Dovecrest Indian Restaurant in Exeter, Rhode Island, which is actually the site where the museum is now. Um, the museum, Tomquag Museum, is an independent nonprofit organization that um, actually has collections from all over North and South America um, that were originally from the collections of Eva Butler, who was an anthropologist, and with Princess Red Wing, a very renowned Narragansett Wampanoag woman who was born in the late 1800s. That was our original curator and traditional educator, um, created Tomaquag Museum in the 19 in 1958 mind mm -hmm. you so it's an old museum mm -hmm. um, in the 1960s the museum moved to Arcadia or Exeter the town of Exeter but the village of Arcadia in in Rhode Island it's near Voluntown for those that are looking for a, a point that's the next town over from Voluntown into Rhode Island um, and we've been in three different buildings in this little Arcadia area um, uh, since the 1960s. So um, my whole entire family, the Dub family, have all been involved in Tomaquag Museum in its early days through today. My mother was the director in the 70s and got the museum its 501c3 to become a nonprofit. Um, as I mentioned, our collections are vast. We have about 20,000 pieces currently is our estimate. Wow. Um, we consistently get donations. We've had an amazing donation recently from Chief Stronghorse, a subchief of the Narragansett Nation who lives in Connecticut, um, is quite elderly now in his 90s, and donated his whole personal collection to Tomaquag Museum. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of work on our collection. We uh, received a wonderful grant that allowed us to have Ani Rivera from Archival Matters come and help us um, in managing collections. There's a lot of work to be done for caring and managing the collections, so we've been doing that. Um, my family has just been very, very involved in the museum um, and certainly through today um, has volunteered on the board and in, in some cases become staff. Until very recently, we always had volunteer staff. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the last 10 years that we started having paid staff, um, if you will, permanent staff. And right now we have three staff, one full-time, myself, mm -hmm. and two part-time, um, Michael Johnson, who's a phenomenal marketing person. Um, who has established our podcast series. Um, it's called Indigenous Artways. If people check out our website, tomaquagmuseum.org, and go to the podcast link, you can get directions on how to subscribe to our podcast. It's free. Um, we are in our fifth week. It's a weekly uh, video content podcast show on traditional arts. So Indigenous Artways is our title. The first four episodes, I'm teaching how to make a dream catcher. Okay, let's so, see a dream catcher. Now, so, everybody's familiar. Now, how so, does yes. uh, your dream catcher differ from other 
Um, and I know you like the, you like to use the term indigenous people. I do, I do, because it brings you to the place that they're from. Because each individual group, um, there's over 550 federally recognized tribes across the nation, and each one of us are different. Mm -hmm. um, and we're distinctly different based off of the location from where we're from. So the life ways of indigenous people in this area, like the Narragansett, that are eastern woodland coastal people, mm -hmm. is very different than a relative of mine, my niece-in-law, who's Dene, or what you might know as Navajo, that are desert mm -hmm. people. Right. So from your life ways comes your um, everything about you, what foods you eat, mm -hmm. the, the, the materials you use for your home and to travel with. So, you know, in our area, a Nushquito or a birch bark home, uh, longhouse, versus um, a hogan okay. of the Navajo, oh, yes. um, which is made like from the clay and the soil of the earth, mm -hmm. um, is, is different, right. you know, and you referenced the teepee, mm -hmm. someone like from the Northern North, Plains, Northern Plains right. not a lot of Tatanka around mm -hmm. here, yes. so we didn't use that, and our resources are different. So the kind of home we made was different, the, the kind of um, uh, travel, if mm -hmm. you look at a map of what we consider Rhode Island and maybe even a map of Connecticut and the river systems that bring you to from the inland points for a winter village to the, the bay or the coastline for your summer villages, you can see why you know, our mm -hmm. means of travel was really the river systems and right. therefore the canoes, the birch bark and dugout canoes, which we have an amazing uh, two birch bark canoes lofted in our museum that you can see. Um, one is actually from my family line from the mid-1800s. Oh, okay. um, very old canoe with no uh, no modern tools, done very old style with the root lashing, lacings and things like that. So you asked about the dream catcher. This particular dream catcher is a sample of one similar to what we teach in the class because we do right. a group tours. Um, in the group tours you can opt to have a craft tour. Mm. Um, and in the craft tour, you could choose dream catchers, which happens to be very popular. But we literally have one hour to teach 20, 25 uh, youth mm -hmm. how to make a dream catcher. Right. So we try to make it very simplistic. Um, and it's mostly about the webbing, but we do give them an opportunity to put a little bit of adornment. So, And if you happen to catch our first series of podcasts, it actually teaches you how to do exactly this. Okay. You can, of course, adorn it much more elaborately, right. add leather, add, you know, fancy stones, pieces of wampum, uh, you know, other, I've done them in classes where it's more like um, an, a, a workshop format mm -hmm. where we've completely beaded all the webbing. So the whole entire thing is beaded, very time consuming. And would this be different if you went, uh, I mean, if, if all the native peoples did this kind of wind catching, is it different in different parts of the country? Would you see a different representation? Oh, of course. I mean, first off, it's art. So everyone has mm. their own uh, flair. If you see the elaborate ones, if you come to Tomaquag Museum, I have a very elaborate dream catcher that's actually made on an antler. Oh. Um, so I'm using my artistic flair, looking at resources in our landscape. I not only have the bigger dream catcher that's all done on the antler, but then I also have fully beaded mini dream catchers on there. Mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't this you can hang over your bed the piece right. of art that I created that way right you can't hang over your bed because no one wants to be hit by an antler in the middle of the night and what's um, the just curious what's the significance of a dream catcher what's well, the, the dream catcher the 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 legend comes out of the Ojibwe community and the idea and I tend to think that some version of this probably mm -hmm. comes out of most communities because everyone has a child they want their children to have good dreams ah. and the idea of the dream catcher is to catch the bad dreams and let using some kind of little mechanism like this line of beads to let the good dream slide through the tiny hole in the center so everyone who has a child wants their child to have good dreams and I so see. this notion of a dream catcher so this was one that we did sort of during the holidays we did it with ribbon rather than with sinew um, which is you know comes from the deer sinew from the okay. the tendon of the animal and so you can use modern materials to make the dream catcher and it just gives a different feel um, so we do different kinds of workshops mm -hmm. that allow people to come in and try it in different okay. ways we've also done it where we go out and this is um, 
it's like natural covered wire, which right. is great when it's this time of the year and you can't go outside and gather a natural branch. But we also do it sometimes in the summer where we take a group and we actually go out on a hike. They collect a green branch and then they actually use a branch ah, to make their okay. ring. Okay. And of course, this one's made with a metal ring. Right. Um, I, we've done plenty that are very elaborate and then you wrap the ring with leather and, and they're fancy that way. So it's an example. We also do in classes um, corn husk dolls, oh. a simplistic version. Here's a little more fancy version. Okay. Um, I think my son made this probably 10 years or more ago. He's right. 18 now. And of course his had to have nunchucks because the boys all want their, their corn husk doll to be very, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's Girl not a doll, it's an action <laughs> figure. <laughs> okay. So, and then this one, I, I don't know, one of, one of my kids made this one as well. But um, the, the classes, you can come and mm -hmm. make cornhus dolls. Last year, we had a wonderful Narragansett Choctaw audit, artist by the name of Dawn Spears. Yes, we're related. <laughs> um, when you're a Narragansett or native, you're always related mm -hmm. to everybody in some kind of way. But she is my um, sister-in-law, married to my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a tremendously talented cornhusk doll. Now these dolls are very simple. She completely dresses her dolls, fully beads her dolls. They're on, sometimes they're in canoes, sometimes they're on platforms, oh, okay. uh, very elaborate, but she does a beautiful demonstration. And this year, we're doing a partnership with Smith's Castle. We mm -hmm. do, just so people know, lots of partnerships. Last year alone, we had 32 different partners. Right. Um, so this year, one of our partners that's new to us, Smith's mm -hmm. Castle over in North Kingstown, Cockham, Sussex, nice Narragansett word there. Right, um, in uh, Rhode Island. In yes. Rhode Island, and th we are partnering with them. They're a, um, a historic place, a historic mm -hmm. colonial place, and of course they tell most of their story from the colonial aspect, but right. they reached out to Tomaquag Museum as Rhode Island's only indigenous museum mm -hmm. to tell the story of the First Peoples. So we have joined forces and we're doing on May 2nd and 3rd, their opening weekend, Indigenous Days. All and right. we're going to have um, native vendors, Dawn Spears will be there doing mm -hmm. corn husk doll demonstrations. We'll be having a couple of workshops on uh, dream catcher and corn mm -hmm. husk doll making. There will be um, wampum artists like Alan Hazard and Craig Spears from the Narragansett community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Kasha Spears will be doing uh, cooking on open fire demonstrations. Dawn Dove will be doing pottery demonstrations. We have about um, 15 mm. different artists that will either be doing, Paula Dove Jennings will be doing storytelling. Um, Dawn Harris, who's both of which are on our podcast series that I um, don't know if I've mentioned or not. Mm -hmm. um, the, we're doing Indigenous Artways, the podcast series, which you can check on our website, uh, but includes some of these will be live right. performances right. At, in, at Smith's Castle, um, but we also have some from past seasons mm -hmm. that are on our podcast. And people line. can just go to Smith's Castle. You don't need yes. a, an appointment or anything. You just no. show up. On right? that, that weekend, and we will be posting that on our events page. Mm -hmm. It's not quite there yet, but it will be there probably by mid-March. So okay. um, all our spring, summer, even going into the fall events, as many of them as we can get up, will be up about mid-March. Um, and so people can kind of get a feel. We are open during the winter months by appointment. We mm -hmm. are actually there five days a week, the staff busy working. Right. Um, but we do group tours, individuals, researchers, whoever you are during the winter by appointment um, because we're combating, like everybody, this wild winter and we're mm. in a very rural spot. Right. Um, but in the spring, summer, and fall, starting on April 1st, we do have some set what we call drop-by hours. For okay. the average tourist visitor that wants to just drop by, we have drop-by hours on Wednesdays from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And then the rest of the week and times for groups, individuals, and families by appointment. Okay. On Memorial Day to Labor Day, mm -hmm. we are a Blue Star Museum, so military families can come to Tomaquag Museum for free. 
Okay. Um, they just have to show their little military ID. Right. And um, we're very happy to be part of that. This will be our third year being part of the Blue Star Museums. Okay, good. Which, um, you know, we know it, there's a lot of active military in Connecticut and mm -hmm. Rhode Island mm -hmm. um, and around the region. So if you're a tourist and you're coming to town, sure. um, feel free. Um, we also do Smithsonian Day in partnership with the, the Smithsonian Museum. They right. have it in September, which is also another free day where people can visit. You um, go on the Smithsonian Day's log in and get mm -hmm. a free coupon to right. come for two people I believe it is and that's right. in the fall right so we, we have a lot of different things in all spring summer and fall there will be um, classes and workshops and um, specialty programs we set up some family days with special youth activities happening um, we have um, book talks where we have different indigenous authors that come mm -hmm. and share their um, the books that they're writing right. and um, filmmakers uh, that come and share their films that are on indigenous content that we have you know events at the museum That's so great. all kinds of things is there an association of indigenous museums around the country hmm uh, okay all right <laughs> that so. i don't know the answer to um i do know that we have different kinds of collaborations that mm -hmm. we do in with different museums i know that you can become a smithsonian affiliate right. don't know quite how you do that i right. haven't done that yet for tom Aquag museum but something that we're thinking about um so that might be one way when you think nationally right um but there is um northeast indigenous arts alliance which tom oh. Aquag museum is a partner in um, that is the initial funding was from the New England Foundation for the Arts, and we are on the the ground floor of being part of that okay. um, alliance. And you know, as a a Native American museum, we certainly partner in the Native American museum zone, other museum and historical societies zone. Right. So we partner with a lot of the Rhode Island local um, and Connecticut local historical societies. You know, we've gone over to Tantaquidgen and we've partnered with Mashantucket Pequot Museum. Okay. And as well as non-native museums, the Warwick Museum of Art and uh, the um, different galleries. So we've partnered and had uh, indigenous art shows at Warwick Museum of Art, um, the Atrium Gallery at um, the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts, to name just a couple that's great that's wonderful because I think it, this is the for many people there is a, a real lack of uh, knowledge uh, although there might be a great deal of interest in the whole idea of the indigenous people um, and of course Narragansett is um, when I as someone who lived for many years in Connecticut I th always thought of because I'd summer down in the Mesquamacate in Rhode mm -hmm. Island I was familiar with with the Narragansett Indians um, not even, not so like the Pequots. I mean, I, we w really didn't he hear much about it until they opened up a casino. But um, the Narragansett Drive has, I think, long been associated with Rhode Island and people that do even, maybe they teach a little bit about it in, in just the public schools in general uh, so that people can become familiar with, with these uh, native tribes. Well, you know, it's an important thing for the familiarity, which is partly why we've started the podcast, to get mm -hmm. a wider right. uh, knowledge, because our goal is to educate the public about uh, Native history, culture, the arts, the environment, and to promote dialogue around this. The mm -hmm. fact that you mentioned that the, the Pequot seemed invisible mm -hmm. at some point really is something that we talk about in general to Indigenous peoples. Um, there's a wonderful film by Wanda Jean Lord. It was part of the PBS We Shall Remain Real Native film series, R-E-E-L, <laughs> Native uh, film series. And it was, it's called Indigenous Invisibility, and we show it at our museum periodically. And it's about the fact that in our own homeland, we're often invisible. Mm -hmm. But yet, when you're driving along Connecticut or Rhode Island or across this nation, I, mean, I believe over 50% of the states are named after the indigenous peoples of that state. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, rivers and, you know, other bodies of water, uh, towns and cities and, you know, uh, buildings and right. businesses and street names that are all named after us. You mentioned Mesquamacate, which is a great, you know, Narragansett word, which means the place of the red fish, oh. you know, the salmon that used to want, run in abundance there. Um, you know, these are really important things. And, you know, it's a, you know, I'm, of course, pleased as a Narragansett person that we are very visible to you as indigenous people. But 
our job as a museum is to not only make the obvious things visible, but maybe some of the things that people are not aware of. So mm. we've done some different things um, recently that help with that. One, we created this book, um, and in, through our eyes, an indigenous view of Mashapog Pond. Okay. Um, we did that in partnership with an organization called UPP Arts. Um, uh, they have a procession called Urban Pond Procession. Mashapog Pond is the largest pond in the city of Providence, Rhode Island, and it's toxically polluted. Right. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, in this modern world with industrialization and urbanization <laughs> and all of these kinds of things, a lot of times our natural resources are polluted. So we did a partnership with their organization, with our organization, and brought together a group of Narragansett people from, I think the youngest was like eight and the oldest 90-something, um, mm -hmm. um, and created this um, book to intertwine the history of this place, Mashapog right. Pond, where the Narragansett people, you know, we don't think of it today as the city as part of where we are from, but reality is the majority of what we consider Rhode Island is where Narragansett people were historically from. And this book um, talks about the history, the ecology, the, um, um, the sense of place and, and who we are as indigenous people, both pre-contact to the present day, which oh. is really, really important to us because we're living in the 21st century. And how does that connect? How do we make that connection for people? And as a museum, that's what we try to do. Get people to understand not just our history, but our history and our present day history right. of who we are. So that's one of the things. We also have um, booklets that this one, um, some people might be familiar with her, Princess Redwing, who I right. mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, very, very phenomenal woman who was an activist before activism was in. She was um, integral in a lot of different things that brought to light indigenous people. While the Narragansett Nation, the history was, in the 1880s, we were detribalized by the state of Rhode Island. Mm. It was proved an illegal action, but it took 100 years to prove that. Wow. Um, so when you think of that, she was doing things at a time period that brought indigenous people to the forefront. She wrote the Narragansett, she wrote, edited and wrote in the Narragansett Dawn, which is a very famous news periodical written in the 30s and 40s. Mm. She um, spoke before the United Nations on indigenous issues. She was an educator in the con contemporary sense as a, in an, a teacher, right. but she also was an educator in a cultural sense, teaching people about native culture through Tomaquag Museum, as well as through her talking to every kind of group from preschoolers to scouts to professors and students at the universities. Right. So she was amazing in, in the things that she does. And we still, as a museum, because of her example, continue to do exactly that. We do programming from preschool right to elders to assisted living communities mm. to scouts to after school programs. We do them on site at Tomaquag Museum, but we also come to you. We have a very vast menu of off site programming opportunities. And people really do um, call us and take advantage of right. that. Along with this booklet, we have a wonderful booklet that also spotlights another wonderful Narragansett person, Ellison Tarzan Brown. And for right. those that are very from the westerly Pawkatuck area, they sure. might remember Ellison Tarzan right. Brown. And right. he was a very famous Narragansett runner who um, won many, many, many marathons up and down the East Coast, but is most noted for winning the Boston Marathon twice. Mm -hmm. And many people are unfamiliar or unaware that Part of the reason we have a spot in that race called Heartbreak Hill is because of him. It's because he took out Johnny Kelly on, on what mm -hmm. became dubbed as Heartbreak Hill mm -hmm. um, by a reporter. Mm -hmm. um, and so Tarzan Brown is definitely deep in the history of um, the Boston Marathon. And we like to share those things. And people within our communities that are important to the history of Rhode Island, New England mm -hmm. and the United States. Indigenous people are woven throughout the fabric of that history. Now, the um, you were you were actually speaking some of the Narragansett language, and actually, you, you were telling me earlier about what actually the museum actually means in the Narragansett. Sure. Mm -hmm. The word Tomaquag actually means beavers in the Narragansett mm -hmm. language. Some people often will also refer to it as the place of the beavers because when we were founded in 1958, we were founded in Tomaquag Valley, which is a hamlet inside the village of Ashaway, inside the town of Hopkinton, and the southern part of Rhode Island. 
um, near Westerly, the next right. town over right. for those that are unfamiliar. Um, so that's where we got our name. Our long legal name is Tomaquag Indian Memorial Museum. Mm -hmm. But in the last few years, we've done a lot of rebranding in this modern <laughs> world. And so we have created new brochures um, that have a brand new logo design. Right. Uh, we kind of gave the beaver a little hidden picture down here. Oh, I see. He used to be our logo or oh, mascot, okay. but people were very confused. They thought they were going to a beaver museum instead of an indigenous <laughs> museum. So we rebranded and created new brochures, um, new brochures for and our educational, educational program. programs, right. and really have um, professionalized the organization. It's a very old organization, and sometimes you can get in the habit of staying in a certain way that you were. Right. And so we've been really working hard to um, bring us forward into the 21st Just century. A, a, a podcast is bringing you into the 21st it century. It most certainly is, Definitely. and I will tell you, it is very, very exciting. Um, we are over 500 downloads in, in five weeks, right. um, which is amazing to me. It's, it's really exciting and a lot of fun. But our ultimate goal of it is to be able to educate the public. This gives us a weekly forum to share cultural knowledge. And reality is these are films that we have at Tomaquag Museum that in some cases, maybe 500 mm. people never saw it before. Right, exactly. And so to have it out there worldwide, sure. you're exposing people, much larger numbers of people to particular films. You know, someone might pick a film tour, but they might only watch The Sovereign Neighbor, Sovereign Nation, which happens to be about the smoke shop raid, or they might only watch indig Indigenous Invisibility. Mm -hmm. um, so this will give us an opportunity. We're going to actually put all of the, our film catalog or most out in our in you know in pieces in our mm -hmm. podcast series to to really broaden the reach of um understanding and exposure to um to Tomaquag Museum and the things that we have to offer how difficult it is is it for um for uh, indigenous people to keep their language alive because I would think you know that's one of the things that uh, people are struggle with uh, across the country so how how do you work it so that I mean, you're speaking the language. Um, how do we get uh, your people to speak the language, to make sure the young know it and mm -hmm. connect? I suppose it's a way of really uh, viscerally connecting to your own people by being Certainly. able to speak the language. It's really important, and it's very difficult in the 21st century, whether we like it or not. You know, I am speaking my native language, what should be my first language, really as a second language. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's very important to us. Um, now, as a museum, of course, sharing about native culture in general, inclusive of language, we have right. a wonderful exhibit called um, Pursuit of Happiness, an Indigenous View that this booklet happens to go with, okay. um, that has writings from the Chief Sachem, Matthew Thomas, the Medicine Man, Running Wolf Wilcox, um, Tribal Elders Ella Sikatau, Dawn Dove, Paula Dove Jennings, and myself. I focused, my writings are on education. And, but Dawn Dove and Ella Sikatau, they focused on language. So mm. within our Pursuit of Happiness exhibit, which is still on exhibit in the museum, there's a whole section on language there and the importance of the continuation of language. And, you know, I always have to flip my hats. There's my hat as the museum person. You know, we're an independent nonprofit organization, uh, not, not run by a particular tribe. Uh -huh. And then my other hat that I'm a tribal member of the Narragansett right. Indian tribe. And, of course, as a museum in Rhode Island, an indigenous museum, we highlight the Narragansett and Niantic peoples and focus on southern New England tribes. Um, so... With that being said, we do a lot around language. When we had Nuichuan School at Tomaquag Museum, um, which was a small independent school that I ran from 2003 to 2010, language was integrated into mm. the curriculum. Um, in our exhibits and in our programming, when appropriate, language is integrated into our, our presentations. Um, when I go out to a school group or other staff goes out to school groups, if they can speak their primary indigenous language, they always introduce themselves, like I would say Askui Kwasin, Natasuis Makasani Peshaw, Natasuis Loren Spears, English at Ni Nahai Gansek Nehantek Kanupiam. So basically I just said hello, right. you know, my name is uh, 
Moccasini Pashao in, in Narragansett, my traditional name, which is the moccasin flower or the lady slipper you might know it as. Um, and my name is Lorenz Spears in English and I am Narragansett Niantic, welcome. So that kind of thing, it's really important. Of course we um, perpetuate language through songs, through um, conversation, even through text, my phone can, um, I always write, I love you to my mother or my kids and family, it already picks it up. You know how the smartphones, they, mm -hmm. you start to spell something? It knows Narragansett words that I use regularly in text. So that's exciting. I think technology um, really is going to help um, in preserving and perpetuating languages across the world, mm -hmm. um, indigenous languages to go forward. Um, my nephew is a high school freshman and he's doing a whole language project on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So he is doing little mini videos um, of him saying s phrases and songs and, and different things, words um, to his uh, twin sisters that are under a year old. Uh -huh. um, and so it, but those things become things that are out there that other people that are trying to learn um, can use. And my mother, hap uh, Dawn Dove, happens to be the, the language teacher for our tribe right now. They're, we kind of come together. I'm part of the language committee for the mm -hmm. tribe, and there's other folks, you know, within the tribal community, elders right down to, you know, families with young children that, you know, go to language classes and, and do different things. We had a big project that was through song. And matter of fact, one of the songs that's on one of our, um, from language class is Chimush 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 Kamashun, and it's in our podcast. Thawn is singing it. Um, I believe he and Eleanor might have wrote the song originally, but mm -hmm. it's Row, Row, Row Your Boat mm -hmm. in Narragansett. And so it's using songs people are familiar with to help translate and, and to remember vocabulary and things like that. So it's really important. And I think um, there's no one in our community that doesn't think it's important, but it is very difficult. We live in the 21st century. People have a lot of responsibilities, mm. jobs, and after school programs, and this thing and that thing. It's very difficult to get to classes. So I think that technology right. will really push that along. We did a whole album maybe three years ago that had 10 brand new songs that were written in the Narragansett language with the idea that new languages are vibrant when new works happen oh, yes. um, rather than true. just what you right. always used. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those songs have become entrenched in our community, particularly the one done, done by the Narragansett elders. Um, a group of the elders went down to the Great Swamp Memorial site and did ceremony and, and created a song about that. And that, of course, every time we do that um, pilgrimage every fall, um, you know, that's separate from the museum per right. se, but the history of it is connected to the museum, of course. Um, th I think that's really powerful that that song in just a very short time has become part of that ceremony and about that of, you know, and really encapsulating who we are. And, and, and some of those elders have sang that at Tomaquag Museum events. So the And Native you brought community. something along, so we're gonna ask you <laughs> if you would be kind enough to sing us a, uh, uh, a Narragansett song with, <clears throat> I assume, a actual Native drum. Sure, I'll sing the welcome song, how's that? Yes, good. So this is a, a, a lovely drum, it's actually elk skin. And it's a little cold, um, being this blustery February, um, and drums don't like the cold, so it's a little bit tinnier than I would like it to sound, because um, it's cold and that's what happens. So I'll try to do it a little softly.
version. <laughs> yes. And what is it actually telling us? Um, it's the welcome song. Okay. Um, it, the word canupiam means welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you ever get the opportunity, the whole audience gets mm. the opportunity. Um, one of the exhibits that we have at the museum happens to be about the Narragansett August Meeting powwow. And um, the reason we, you know, the idea was to do a powwow exhibit so people could understand what a powwow was about. Right. Um, but we chose the Narragansett powwow because it is the oldest recorded native gathering in the whole entire United States. This year will be 340 years wow. recorded. Okay. So, of course, all of our communities were doing these gatherings way before European contact. So the uniqueness is that it's been recorded for that long mm. and, and makes it very unique and special. Um, so it's always hosted on the Narragansett Reservation in Charlestown, Rhode Island, the weekend that hosts the second Sunday. It is both Saturday and Sunday, but if you mm. find the second Sunday in August on any given year, right. it's that weekend. Okay. Um, and Tomaquag Museum always has a vendor stand there, and uh, so that's always nice. You can come and say hi. Right. And um, there's, you know, music and dance and uh, drumming and storytelling and uh, vendors and food. You can try different things. Sure. Um, and so forth. Matter of fact, one of the vendors, um, uh, Sherry Pocknick, who happens to be Wampanoag from uh, down on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, she is um, going to be vending at our event um, at Smith's Castle oh, okay. um, because we wanted to have um, a food vendor that had a lot of traditional foods and she does, you know, venison on mm. a stick and uh, frog legs and uh, smoked salmon, which mm. of course it might seem mainstream, but anything from the ocean was the traditional food for us and, right. and so forth. So it's, it's going to be wonderful. That'll be a lot of fun. And the public is obviously open. Uh, it's to, open to, to the, the public, public and yeah. that happens to be at Smith's Castle on May 2nd and Third, and I will have that on our website along mm. with our own events that will be taking place at Tomaquag Museum and any other partnership events that we'll have. Um, um, and the uh, and the powwow is also open to the public. The powwow is still also open to the public. Right. Um, we usually list the local powwows as well mm -hmm. on our website, even though they're not hosted by Tomaquag Museum. We're in support of them, so right. we would definitely host. We'll post that as well. On our website, so are there that a number can... of tribes that do uh, powwows beside? Uh... Oh yes, okay. um, the Mashantucket. Uh, there, all of these are in August. Actually, um, there is the Narragansett powwow is like, you know, the weekend of the second Sunday. Then mm. it's followed by Mohegan, then Mashantucket, and then across the Sound over at Shinnecock on Long Island. Oh yes. Um, so th they're one right after the other, and we go to all of them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's smaller, those are like the major big ones, Right. but there's lots of other small ones. There, uh, The Rhode Island Indian Council hosts one at Roger Williams um, Park, mm. you know, near the zoo park. Um, there's sometimes one at the Rod Williams National Memorial, a smaller one that's hosted at uh, Rhode Island's only national park on North mm -hmm. Main Street in Providence. Um, so there's, you know, there's right. different, I think there's even one at the Grodin Center, mm -hmm. um, I think is in Warwick. So th they're all over the place. If you go, I think there's even a website, powwows.com, that just lists them nationally. Oh, well, um, so, so you can see all kinds of ones. Um, there, you know, there, there are various lists so that you can see. And some are small, some are big, right. and some are medium. So, And they're in August. Is that because that's the harvest season? Is that traditionally uh, for, why? For the, the tribes that I mentioned locally, that seems to be, uh -oh. like, I know, I can only speak to my own. Well, actually, I think even Skimitsin is the green corn. I, they're all at that time of the green corn. And if you think about it, um, Southern New England tribes would have a, a similar cyclical season. You know, traditionally we celebrate 13 Thanksgivings. Mm. Um, not one as America does today. We celebrate many, one for each new moon of the year. Oh. So um, even at Tomaquag Museum, we have events like um, the Strawberry Thanksgiving in June um, where people can come together. And we do have a small ceremony and we have events around the strawberry. There's tours of the museum, there's dance demonstrations and op storytelling and opportunities for um, people to come and enjoy um, native games, whether right. that be a um, moccasin game that we play, which mm -hmm. has a hider, there's a song and music, <laughs> or hubbub bowl game, which uh, you take the, the thing and you do like this and there's stones in here and oh. they flip around um, and uh, you play the game with that. So people can learn how to play these different games at our events. Right. Um, but there's, you know, traditionally there's 13, so um, the Green Corn Thanksgiving aligns with um, 
the Narragansett powwow as well as with the Pequot powwow. So, okay. you know, they, they, the powwow today stems from those traditional Thanksgivings of years before. And within our communities, we still have many Thanksgivings that are not open to the public. Right. So um, they continue to go on, whether that um, be the cranberry or the, the green bean or the <laughs> green, the corn planting moon or the maple sugar Thanksgiving. So there's, there's and you can come to the museum and we'll tell you about all of them. Right. Um, and how we still celebrate them today within our communities. Now, the other thing that is kind of important is that you can come to the museum, but you actually will go to other places. Oh, That's yes. That's how I first met you. Yes. Was that a, another group uh, actually, I guess you were invited as a speaker, and you yes. went there and you gave a demonstration. So yes, we get invited. Um, we do programming in various ways off-site, so we can come and do a talk or a lecture, however you want to term it, um, often with visuals from like a, a pre mm -hmm. PowerPoint kind of presentation where right. you can see, which was what you were have. We were celebrating women, so that was a woman's focus. Um, we have focuses that um, presentations on honoring our veterans to sovereignty, about wampum, um, I'm actually going to be going over to the Shinnecock Museum and doing a presentation there in a few weeks or month, two months from now, I guess. Um, so there's, you know, we go to other organizations, mm -hmm. whether that be libraries. We were out on Block Island and many of the various libraries. We do book talks, um, roundtable discussions on certain topics and right. areas. Um, the list goes on, as well as performance. So we can go mm. to schools and clubs and do storytelling, music, dance kinds of performances that engage kids and allow them to participate when appropriate. Um, so, you know, different teachers right. and people will ask for different topics. On our website, we have a whole list okay. of kind of what kinds of tours that we do, what kinds of off-site programming, but we also specialize. So I have uh, had a, a group that that called and wanted to do a variety of things and they're planning for the summer because we're already booking out into June, July, and August. Right. Not to say there aren't little gaps in mm. the current schedule. So people, you know, we're also it's have, you, you're like a we one also man have, band, right? We also have programs, <laughs> you know, right now happening. But you know, some people will do combinations. So they'll come to the museum or have us come to them and they'll do the the tour, the mm -hmm. scavenger hunt with kids. They'll, you know, create an art piece, play right. a game, uh, watch a presentation mm -hmm. on, um, you know, uh, the environment, ecology of Mother Earth, because Earth Day is coming up. Right. So there's lots of different topics and things that are happening. So, so and then the, the real big, big future news is that you have a small, physically a small space. And Currently, you have yes lots and lots of things to exhibit and you need more space so most definitely so, so why don't you tell the audience a little so we bit about are, the new plans yes it's very mm -hmm. very exciting yes do we mean. are working in partnership about for the last year and a half or so with the westerly land trust they have a couple of potential sites that we might join forces and create this building this wonderful image on the front of our master plan mm -hmm. um, to create a new museum. Um, our current site is a place that we lease um, and it's an old, was an old mill owner's building and then it was a church and, and it's been, it was a restaurant. So oh. it's been a lot of different yes. incarnations. And this, um, as much as we love the space and it certainly has a history with having the Dovecrest Indian restaurant there, the reality is, in order to care for our collections, we need to get into the kind of building that can be climate controlled, mm -hmm. humidity controlled, lighting controlled, all of those kinds of things that are best practices for museums right. and give us the appropriate amount of storage space so that things can be stored properly so researchers can have better access. We have a lot of researchers that come every year. Um, I think my last count is about 24 a year. Mm. And they're coming to the museum, they're researching for books, for um, films, for their PS PhD dissertations, mm -hmm. you name it. And I'm not talking about your high school researchers, I'm talking about college and beyond researchers right. um, that are utilizing Tomaquag Museum and its resources for their films. And, and for us, it's a win-win because our goal is to educate the public right, and so that gives another mechanism sure. in which to do that. So the, the, the project here was funded through the Forrest and Francis Latner Foundation mm -hmm. and in partnership with the Westerly Land Trust. So we're right. very excited about the possibility in the coming years for us to relocate right. um, our facility to Westerly um, and 
have the opportunity to partner with the land trust because, of course, environment is very important to us as indigenous right. people. That's very exactly. important, and the education around that is ideal. Um, and so we've been working on this for a couple of years. This is the very beginning because this is master planning. We still need to do the full-blown architectural plans, which we're in writing grants right now to be able to fund. Right. Um, but we were blessed with a grant from um, the United States Department of Agriculture. Okay. That These are the preliminary plans okay. of um, the exhibit design mm -hmm. um, of our of new interactive music. Uh, showing exhibitions yes showing yes, what sure. our exhibitions might be mm -hmm. like and how they might fit into the new space of this new museum probably around June between now and June we should have both sets of plans these are in final production right now so they mm -hmm. should be done probably by the end of March right. and so the goal will be by once both pieces are done we're going to turn it into like a moving uh, slideshow right. video type thing to put on our website so then people will be able to see these images on our website right. in our um, uh, we do have a page that has that's connected to our Flickr from our honoring dinner event um, that has some pictures of the live the, you know the big models mm -hmm. that were there that are on our website now but we'll have them all conjoined together and and have a good presentation for people to see as we're moving forward so it's very exciting along with that the USDA grant is funding um, a big business planning and research where I've been traveling all up and down the East Coast looking and visiting museums and talking to their executive right. directors about right best practices mm -hmm. and, and great ideas and what pitfalls to avoid and what things were just fantastic to do. And so that we can do the best to serve our public and provide opportunities for people to learn and to gather sure. and to be part of this great opportunity. I mean, we do we have a lot of volunteers, so mm -hmm. we're always looking for volunteers. Okay. And you don't have um, to be in Narragansett. Oh, or, oh, oh no! Oh, okay. Our museum, we have, um, you know, we've had staff and volunteers and consultants and and visitors that are of every walk of life, and okay. our partners are of all walks of life. It's very important to us to be inclusive and to um, to respect others and their life path. Mm -hmm if we want them to respect ours. Exactly. So it's, it's very important to be able to share those things. And it's our board is, you know, we're a native run organization, so it's a majority native, but we have board members that are non-native as okay. well. Um, you know, our, our requirement is just 51% or more native, native. and okay. um, by our bylaws. But we always are looking for new board members mm -hmm. um, every year. Um, we're particularly looking for folks right now. You know, as a native educational kind of facility, you always kind of get people that are have a lot of native cultural content and a lot of education content. Mm -hmm. Like we have quite a few professors from various universities serving on oh, our board. Okay. Um, wonderful people and, and very much contributing to what we're doing. Um, and I'm so thankful for our board and our staff because of that. But we really could use some board members in, uh, in a couple of diverse areas, business, finance, and legal. So okay. if there's someone out there that's yes, interested. Yes, a lawyer, <laughs> a finance person out there, yes, absolutely. Yeah, board, you know, you need board members that have those different varying expertise sure. to, to make sure that we do um, things that are in the best for our organization and for the public that we serve. Right. And you were uh, gracious enough to give us some photographs. So we have a kind of a little photographic uh, history of your family and the museum um, and some other activities that have been going on. So we're going to kind of flash some of those photographs on the screen. And you can talk oh, a little so this bit about is it. us at the Warwick Museum of Art, a partnership that we did there. Um, and these are some uh, uh, tribal community members. Um, I can't remember specifically which tribes they are. I think Wampanoag and, uh, might be one of them. I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure. Um, actually, that uh, finger woven piece on the left is a piece of artwork that I did. Oh, um, okay. And, but we were, I was the co curator of this art show and we partnered with the Warwick Museum of Art. We've done it twice now there um, with the idea of bringing traditional and contemporary native arts into non-native environments. Right. Very good, yes. So absolutely. it's really important and we've done that with the Atrium Gallery at the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts as well. So let's see what other, we have other photographs. Sure, this is some folks from, uh, two of them are board members or past board members. They're actually in front of our silent auction at our mm -hmm. annual honoring dinner. We, mm -hmm. we host that every year with the idea of honoring people that have impacted Tomaquag Museum. Okay. And so that's important to us and we, right. we like to honor folks.
And, and this happens to be the honoring dinner from 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, it has Thon Harris singing an honor song along with his wife, Eleanor Dove Harris, and myself standing at the podium. Mm -hmm. There is Elena Calderon Patino from the Rhode Island State Council on the Arts. Um, she was with us that um, partnered to sponsor um, the first Indigenous art show at the Atrium Gallery, okay. and that's why we honored her. There's Narragansett Tribal Elder Alberta Wilcox, um, honored as a wisdom keeper and knowledge bearer for the Narragansett community, and she certainly supported Tomaquag Museum and has taught classes on finger weaving and um, and shared her her traditional knowledge. Right. And then there was, oh, so you flipped away, but um, it was the governor. Right, our the, former the, governor. Our former governor, right. Governor Chafee, who has been very supportive of indigenous arts and arts programming for Tomaquag Museum and was very, very integral in that. And the last person was Dawn Spears, who um, was the Native Arts uh, Coordinator at the New England Foundation for the Arts. Um, and very integral in a lot of the programming that we did here at Tomaquag Museum, as well as being an artist herself. Right. And do we have some more? Uh -huh. uh, this is um, two Narragansett tribal members, uh, Keela Reyna and uh, John Pompey, that they're spotlighted in this picture. They're part of a presentation that we do honoring our veterans. Both oh. of them are veterans. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a long line, long history of um, veterans in the indigenous community. Mm -hmm. And our presentation doesn't just focus on Narragansett veterans, but veterans across the United States. But because indigenous people per capita have the highest rate of service in the armed forces in, uh, out of all ethnic groups in the United States. Amazing. And most people are not aware of that. Amazing. And yes, so we absolutely. share a lot about that in our presentation with lots of different information. And then you have that special Star Museum time yes, where they can the come. Blue Star Museum yes, where all, all veterans, all veterans and, can share. Well, actually all military families. Okay. Yes. And then do we, yes, here we are. So this is up in our collections um, resource area where we store our collections and it has Paula Dove Jennings who is our volunteer curator and then Deneen uh, De Quintel, who is an in, had been a past intern and has volunteered since she's got her PhD now mm -hmm. and, and, and comes periodically to help us work and actually if you had pictures of our current state we have done a tremendous amount of work over the last five months on that whole facility and have thanks to grants from the Champlin Foundation and another matching grant from another foundation um, we've had the opportunity to work with Archival Matters and Ani Rivera and do a tremendous mm. amount of work on restructuring our whole collection storage facility. Um, we have, a, on essence, about 5% of our collections is actually on exhibit. Oh, wow. But we have approximately 20,000 objects in our collection. It's mm. a very vast collection. Mm. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work to help make that better available to the sure. public. The public and researchers, of course. Definitely. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And do we have some more? Oh, oh this is a visitor um, <laughs> that allowed us to take a picture of her and her son. We do preschool programs once uh -huh. a month. Um, of course, we can accommodate them on drop-by days as well, but we do special activities where they can do special games, songs, little uh, kid-appropriate cartoon videos, um, and, and, and things that are specific to young people so that they can really engage. Oh, great. That's great. It's a lot of fun. And do we ask, yes, here we go. And this is us out in, uh, and volunteers, out in our garden. Mm. So not only do we have inside exhibits, in the summertime we have outdoor exhibits, and we're out in the garden um, working to set it up. We have corn, bean, and squash, the three sisters, along with onions and sunflowers and um, sweet grass, which is a medicinal herb used for um, prayer and uh, oh, okay. other medicinal purposes um, that are in our garden. So those are just you know some of the things mm -hmm. that we do, and we're always looking for volunteers to help us. We try to act as a community garden, right. um, and we do, when we have excess materials in our garden that aren't used during programming, we try to give it to um, the elders within the Narragansett community and or the Johnny Cake Center or okay. any place else that has elders and people that might be in need of extra mm. crops. Okay. And we, yeah, there we go. This is John Christian Hopkins, uh, a Narragansett author. Um, he came and did a book talk um, uh, recently um, on one of his books called Cala Magno, The Pirate Prince of the Caribbean, which is kind of a fictional take of what happened after King Philip's War. Uh -huh. um, it's a great book, and it, it's great to have different Native authors present, and we mm. love to share that with the public. And we do that periodically throughout the year, have different Indigenous and sometimes other non-Indigenous authors that are writing Indigenous content right. to share their work. Sure, absolutely. Filmmakers as well. We've had... Um, uh, 
uh, Stories in Stone by Mark Lovett presented there and it's about Narragansett stonemasons. So oh, it's okay. And then I guess we have time for one more. This is um, Lindsay Montanari, which was a Narragansett youth that was my intern last year, along with uh, Dana Nugent, who is a professor at URI, another partner that we have. And mm. she was doing filming and photography. She actually, a film that she created about Narragansett artists, she interviewed five Narragansett artists with his support. Mm. Um, is actually going to become one of our new podcasts oh, in, the, in the coming weeks. It's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. It's wonderful. So I think we're going to kind of wrap up. It was wonderful. I mean, what a nice lesson in the Narragansett tribe uh, to have you and talk about the museum and talk about your family and have a little nice song that we had there. <laughs> um, there's you. so much stuff that we have. We didn't even talk about what looks to be right here oh, on the top. Sure. This, we, I just brought some stone implements that. Um, was gifted to us recently, but we have a very vast collection of stone tools in mm -hmm. our exhibits and in our collection. So I wanted to just share that. Right. Um, a lot of folks are very interested oh, in, yes, yes. In, in stone points, knives and scrapers and mm -hmm. arrow points and things like that. Um, we also spotlight different Narragansett artists. You mentioned my family again, mm -hmm. which I did a very poor job of really <laughs> mentioning. Um, but my, my husband, Robin Spears, um, was actually on the front of the Terre Haute Times recently uh, paper uh, because he presented at the Charlestown Town Hall his artwork. And so we have a very, our community is full of amazing traditional artists. Right. Alan Hazard, um, who is this amazing wampum artist of the jewelry that I'm wearing today, mm -hmm. both earrings and necklace, um, owns a little shop called the Purple Shell on Route 1 in Charlestown. We partner with all these folks. We do wonderful programming with them on workshops and demonstrations. But also, um, it's a great opportunity to get um, people to learn through the arts about Native culture today. And so, so give us again the, uh, your email address and your information so that people can contact you, not sure. only to come to the museum, to go to find information about the powwow, the podcast, and uh, you know all of the programming activities that you have. Yes, you can reach us at 401. 491-9063, or you can email me, Loren Spears, L-O-R-E-N-S-P-E-A-R-S, at tomaquagmuseum.org, T-O-M-A-Q-U-A-G-M-U-S-E-U-M.org. And if you just add slash podcasts, you can go to the podcast feed. Um, and you can reach me and ask me anything you'd like. Um, I often, if we don't have... It available at our site. We often will refer people to other Native artists or organizations depending on what it is that you're looking for. We are happy to, you know, be a conduit to your knowledge about Indigenous culture. So I want to thank uh, um, my guests for coming to talking with us and showing us all this wonderful <laughs> stuff, singing us a song, and um, I thank you very much for coming. And I want all of my thank viewers you. to get out there and visit this museum. Uh, and, uh, and, and tell them you saw it here at Community Culture Showcase. That's how you learned about this wonderful museum. If you have other wonderful little museums, historic homes, uh, even some wonderful little uh, quirky arts groups out there, let me know about them. Grace and Harriet at gmail.com. Let me know about them so I can add them to my guest list. Um, our next guest coming up will be a, um, a string group. Uh, we had a great time with Craig Edwards, who is one of our Roots musicians, and he led us on to a bunch of other wonderful musicians out there. So we're always looking for great guests. So I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you get to this museum. And this is Harriet Grayson, and I thank you for watching. And this is Community Culture Showcase.